Yeah, my name is Tom Bailey. I head up the research and innovation team at C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. Um, I'm here to talk about the link between sustainable, um, climate safe development um, of cities worldwide and the link of that um, and the health of our citizens. So, first of all, a bit of context um, two of the meta trends um, of the 21st century obviously are climate change, um, our sort of desperate efforts to drive it as fast as we possibly can. Um, combined with um, anything we could do to try and mitigate um, or adapt to the worst of its impacts. Um, uh, combined with urbanisation, obviously huge amounts of people moving into cities as well as the population growing overall, imply that two and a half billion more people will be living in cities roughly uh, by 2050. Um, uh, you know, that, that's compared to about three and a half billion today. So if you imagine for every 10 people living in a city today, there will be an extra seven by 2050. So that's with all those roads, with all those um, uh, cables with all that, uh, you know, the energy industry needs to be produced, the hospitals that needs to be built, all the infrastructure associated with that. It's a tremendous thing to get your head around. Now you combine that with the fact that most cities on the coast, or the majority on the coast, are very exposed to sea level rise. Um, heat island effect, meaning the cities are, are hotter than their surrounding area, so droughts resulting from, um, sorry, heat waves resulting from climate change they're particularly exposed to. Um, you know, they're, they're removed from, typically, removed from their water sources and their, their food sources, so they're particularly particularly exposed to drought and other risks of the supply chain. Um, and in fact, we think that 1.3 billion people roughly will be at extreme risk from climate change um, by 2050 in cities. Um, and already 70% of our cities think that they're, they're seeing the impacts of climate change. Now this is combined with the fact that actually cities, as the primary um, economic hubs, um, consumer of goods and services, are actually the ones driving climate change as well. And, and so, so cities are a sort of really interesting spot in terms of how they, the focal point for the impact, but also if we're going to do something about climate change and stop it, then obviously cities are the, a, a key focus area for it. Now, in recognition of that, C40 was set up, I don't know if you, many of you know what C40 is, but I'll explain very quickly. C40 City Climate Leadership Group was set up 10 years ago by um, uh, the Mayor of London at the time, Ken Livingston and Bill Clinton, soon after he got involved. Um, and, and it's a network of cities come together to take action on climate change about 10 years ago. Now about 91 cities, going to try and level out at 100. We may change our name to C100 maybe at that point. Then. <laughs> but, um, um, and the, the three things I think that make C40 stand out and make our, our <coughs> success, three things. One, it's a network of mayors so, um, and, and political leaders come together to take action. And we represent those mayors. So we're not a campaign group knocking on doors trying to get people to do something. We actually work for the mayors. Um, and so we're able to engage with the cities, their staff, engage in their policy programs, and also to an extent represent them, which gives us an enormous amount of influence, which is fantastic. Um, the second point being that our model is based on peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. So there's no one better to get a mayor to do something radical um, and change the way that their, um, their city is operating than another mayor who's done it and seen the benefit and whose who, who citizens have rewarded them for it. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, bringing cities together in networks around particular issues, <coughs> around um, transport, around buildings, and increasingly now around the wider benefits of action, um, as we'll come on to in a bit. The third point that makes C40 so, um, effective is that we're an evidence-based organisation. So we, um, and, uh, we, we, we don't ask our cities to pay for being part of membership. All we ask them to do is give, them all that, give, them, give us all our da their data. And I have the privilege of being able to use that data and try and turn it into um, helpful narratives, strategy, <coughs> prioritisation, um, tools, evidence, to help cities move towards that kind of goal we're all about. So that's C40. And recently what we did was we committed, rather boldly, I must say, to, um, to uh, uh, delivering the Paris Agreement because, as we saw on the first side, citizens are exposed massively to the risk of climate change. The collective global um, view on what climate safe future looks like is that 1.5 is, is, is what we should be aiming for. If you get to 2, everything starts to get very uncertain. If you get to 2.5 and 3, then you know, the risks and the, 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 the damage that we've done will be uh, enormous. Um, and, and what does that look like? So here we've got a, um, a curve across the top, uh, this line, sorry, is C40's emissions back from a few years ago. Um, if we do nothing, we carry on with the policies we currently have. Where we need to go beyond, the trajectory we need to be on, if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement and deliver all that, you know, the safety um, that, that implies, we need to be across this line across the bottom, which is, um, you know, a, a huge, uh, there's no units on it, but you get the general shape of it. The, um, and by 2050, we need to be zero carbon. Um, uh, and so that, what that requires is a staggering <coughs> change in the way cities function um, bottom up, you know. This, this implies that many of our global south cities um, uh, will have close to zero carbon transport by 2030. <coughs> um, that's what we're saying and what the global what, what the, what the evidence associated with 
power agreement said we need to do if we're going to deliver that safety for the cities. So that's a huge thing to ask um, of our cities. Um, and, and what we're doing is we, we've committed to delivering um, supporting our cities by preparing a detailed policy roadmap or a climate change action plan for every one of our cities that is consistent with this curve by the end of this decade, so in about three more years. Um, and so all of the cities, 100 biggest cities in the world, will know what to do and will have committed to that trajectory. Now, that is within the context, obviously, of the real world. You know, citizens, we can't, we can't ask our mayors just to drop everything else they care about and what their citizens care about and focus just on reducing carbon emissions. You know, the, the Sustainable Development Goals is a really nice way of outlining actually all the other things that they need to be caring about, particularly in the Global South. Now, the Global South, you know, on that curve that we just saw, obviously the Global South is at the moment quite a low emitter, but their trajectory is, is, is enormous. And, and you know, to, to expect them, those cities, to want to, sort of, to, to not focus on growing um, their economies and, and all the other things associated on this and focus just on climate, it's been very difficult. So we have this kind of um, this context to work in, um, but happily we also have increasingly you know, global frameworks that allow us to outline well, what are these different things we're aiming at. We've got the Sustainable Development Goals, we've got the, the New Urban Agenda, we've got the Paris Agreement, all these sort of visions of the future that we want to try and bring together. But at the moment we have no framework for relating them and saying, okay, how do we deliver a policy, um, or a, as a, if you're a leader of a, of a mayor, <coughs> of a city, how do you square off all these different agendas? You know, some, so in some regions of the city, we may care about some more than others, um, and it's, you know, it's a very complicated picture. Happily, this is one of my favorite, um, favorite images, but um, happily, you know, a green city, one that is environmentally sustainable, where you have access to public transport, um, uh, where you've got clean air, you know, these things deliver environmental goals, but also, there are much nicer places to live, right? and they're much healthier places to live, um, as we all know. And uh, have, the, the, the message, the takeaway from this is that we don't have to deliver all of those different um, objectives as shown on the previous slide separately. We can deliver a policy program which can simultaneously work on all of them. Um, and cities, in particular, are a great place to live, are a great place um, uh, to do that. Because cities are the focal point, as I said earlier, of, of driving the environmental impact, receiving the, the, that, that, that impact back. You know, in terms of the, the damage done. But then also it's a focal point for social systems, environmental systems, so any policy you want to in a city will naturally touch on all of those spaces. So if you design it right, you can deliver on them all. Now, I haven't got long left, and I've been talking too long, so I'll, I'll move on quickly. So, some some uh, example research that we've been doing shows the manifold <coughs> health benefits of policies, um, uh, climate policies in cities. For instance, stuff that's going on in our city, this is all ex post work, so this is measured. Um, uh, solar hot water in Johannesburg in some of the really poor areas where they currently combust fuel um, for heating and for, for, water, for, um, <coughs> for cooking and stuff like that um, has saved you know, uh, close to 100,000 US dollars we expect um, and, and up to 22 lives um, per, year, per year. Bus rapid transit, which is when you take a, um, you take a, a road, take, a, take one of the, the, the lanes in the road, make it just for buses. Um, very, very, um, and then you put lots of bus infrastructure along that. Very, very quick and cheap way of moving people around very quickly and something you can build very quickly. Which is great for climate change, but also it means people are no longer in their cars, they're sort of walking to the station, they get more exercise done. It's like, so, um, Santiago estimates up to 10 deaths being saved a year and up to 67 million US dollars in, um, in time where people are no longer feeling ill, they're no longer off work, they're sort of more it because they're more healthy because they're exercising more. And then bike lanes in Mexico, similar numbers, 10 deaths per year, and so on. Um, now, despite all this, uh, we did a survey recently into what are the main barriers that are holding our cities back from delivering on that, that climate change goals. And uh, I mean, you don't have to worry about the detail of this, but that red blob, the red circle at the top, and the red section at the top, came back as the main challenge. And this was making the case for climate action. Now, it's a shock for us, as we speak to speak, we're, we're a network of supposedly pioneering political leaders in climate change, and they came back and said to us that the main thing stopping us taking action on climate change and delivering that climate safe future is convincing themselves and their citizens and their colleagues to do anything on climate. So, um, uh, which was the shock. Um, and the reason being, there's two main elements. The meta-narrative, people see, you know, I have to deal with my poverty problem first. I have to deal with the fact that my citizens can't have that sanitation, but they're living in informal settlements before they can even think about climate change. You know, which across the global south is a fairly universal problem, and it stops us even getting into the room to have a conversation. Um, but as we all know, that's not the case. You can't deliver on them all at once if we can only make the case on them. Um, and then the second one, even if these cities are convinced of the benefits that, um, <coughs> of, 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 um, of climate action, they don't have the evidence to actually make the case. If I'm going to do a congestion charge that's going to reduce, improve air quality um, and improve the, you know, the health of all my citizens, it's 
the mayors know about that, but they don't have the evidence to prove it. And the amount of political sort of pushback they'll get means they don't do it. So they need the data. And this is where research comes in now, because this is uh, it's one of those exciting times where research can be produced today. It can be used by mayor tomorrow to do something very powerful. And we're doing this all the time at C40. Um, okay. um, and um, we've, we've established a work program, a research program, that's been running about two years. Um, the intent being we can start to sort of catalyze this virtuous cycle by providing cities with the evidence around the health benefits, um, financial benefits and others of climate action. Then they're able to make the case and get the action implemented. Um, you're able to engage citizens um, in that. I mean, we recently, it's recently we, the, the BRT that was established in um, Phoenix, partly to improve air quality. No one got it. You know, people, it was built nice and shiny, but no one got on it and used it because people were driving past in their cars. It didn't change their beha behavior because no one had made the case to them that this would improve their health, that this would be beneficial for all sorts of ways. It's not just enough to, to implement policy. You need to get people involved in it. That maximizes the impact of it. Obviously, when people get involved, maximizes the benefit. And you can measure that, and then it makes you can use that to make the case again. It's a virtual cycle. Hopefully, we're in this explosion of climate action that we need. Um, and so, where does, what's the way forward on this and the research we're doing? Um, I mean, I could talk, I could delve into this much more in detail um, if we get into the discussion if we want. Um, but the, the uh, ultimately, the, these are the main steps that we're being undertaking. The first thing, obviously, is the framework for measuring this stuff. Like, what, how, what are the different types of benefit, the different types of impact? I talked about health impacts earlier: mortality versus morbidity, um, jobs, you know, direct, indirect, induced jobs. How do we measure these different things? What are the best making the case? Um, and, and how do you relate policy impacts? So this is a, this back here is a is a map of the, of the framework we developed. It's all the, 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 the back room of the tool that we use to guide our cities in relating policies across different sectors, like transport, waste, how they relate to different agendas down here, so different impacts, different SDGs, um, by different causal chains, and what is it, you know, and, and starting to guide them through the process of doing these calculations and getting those numbers out so they can make the case for action. So that framework um, is a key, um, key thing which we've done. We're now building a global evidence base, set up an organization, 15 or so um, partners, including UNEP and, uh, and People seen a good range of people to try and build this club down in the face of the cities. Whenever they want to deliver a congestion charge, they can just dip into this. So oh, there's in Bogota, they delivered this many lives saved. And we can start to, you know, that can be, and then, and then linking onto that, the, the means for them to engage with that in developing their policies. Um, uh, and then finally, integrating that into their action planning. So if, we're, if you were, if, if the London, for instance, London, the climate change mitigation and energy strategy, has um, a plan to get down to, I think, zero carbon by 2050, it's, you know, or 80% reduction by 2050. That's going to require a lot of costs and a lot of input. But if they can put onto that the amount of jobs that they will create at the same time, then that really helps them sell that policy agenda and get the stakeholders in the city involved and get it delivered. And then finally, the leadership, just to sort of to change that global narrative that I was talking about earlier. So I think that's, I could go into a lot, I haven't gone into a lot of detail into the actual research. Um, 